Hi, I'm Greg Marcus. I'm the pastor of Improved Life Christian Center. This is our Sunday morning church service via the internet. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Right now we're on the gospel prosperity. Some people would call that the controversial subject of, you know, of prosperity. Hallelujah. But I'm trying to show you from the Bible that God wants it to go well with you in life, that God wants you to prosper, that God wants you to have more than enough, that God promises to abundantly supply his people. Hallelujah. Those who follow him, God promises to prosper, to make wealthy, to abundantly supply his people. God, the God of the Bible, Bible, the Bible, God, the God speaking in the Bible, he promises to abundantly prosper, supply, to bring his people success, to, for it to go well with his people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They would become wealthy and prosperous and successful and live long lives and be healthy. Hallelujah. That's the Bible promises. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's what the Bible, God, says about it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we're discussing the gospel, the good news of prosperity, that God's on your side when it comes to material and financial things. God is on your side when it comes to material and financial things. God wants it to go well with you in your material and financial and whatever other well-being that you have here on this earth. God isn't just interested in over there when you get to the other side. God isn't just interested in you going to heaven when you die. God's interested in your life right here on this planet. He wants it to go well with you right here, right now on this planet. Hallelujah. 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 And I told you before that we first began to study the Bible with Pastor Price, hallelujah, in Los Angeles, at Crenshaw Christian Center in Los Angeles, California. And Pastor Price, one of the subjects he would teach us, you know, he would go through the Bible teaching. Hallelujah. Most people can't stand teaching. Hallelujah. Most Christians can't stand teaching. That's why there's so much ignorance in Christianity. Hallelujah. Most people, most Christians want somebody else to do the thinking for them. Hallelujah. Just tell them what to think. Just tell me what to think. Just tell me what it doesn't work that way hallelujah that's why there's so little the faith of most christians is so little and so small because they're not putting any effort into it hallelujah if you want to grow if you want to increase if you want to develop in your faith if you want to grow in the things of god if you want to increase in your knowledge of god you've got to get into the bible hallelujah you've got to learn to study the bible for yourself you've got to listen to people who are teaching the bible who aren't just just preaching and trying to stir up, stir you up emotionally, trying to tell you what to think, but they're teaching you what the Bible says. Hallelujah. They're teaching you what God through his word says. Hallelujah. Not what they think, not what they figured out, not what their ideas are, but what the Bible says. Hallelujah. And that's what Pastor Price was. He was a Bible teacher. In my experience, most people prefer the preacher. Yeah! You know what I mean? Hallelujah. There's a place for preaching. Hallelujah. But without Bible teaching, people will not grow. Without Bible teaching, Christians will not grow. Without Bible teaching, you cannot develop in the things of God. Without Bible teaching, you cannot grow in the things of God. And so what we have right now in Christianity is these, these little baby Christians, 80-year-old baby Christians. They still have to be fed the bottle. Come on, okay, baby. 80-year-old Christian. They've been a Christian for 80 years. We still got to change their diaper. We still got to give them their baba, baba. Here's your baba. Here's your little pacifier. You just pacify you. I'm like, why? Because they refuse to grow. Why? Because growth requires effort. Growth requires effort. It required, might require you to change some things that you're doing. It might require you to recognize that some of the things you're doing is not right. Hallelujah. Might make you uncomfortable. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, if you're not uncomfortable, you're not growing. Hallelujah. If you're not uncomfortable, you're not growing in the things of God. Hallelujah. Anyway, so Pastor Price 
was a Bible teacher, and one of the subjects he taught in that manner, you know, going step by step through the Bible, showing us scripture after scripture. That's why I teach this way, because Pastor Price taught that way. Hallelujah. Papa Hagen taught that way. Teaching the Bible. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And one of his subjects was prosperity. And when I first heard him teach about that, I mean, he's just going through scriptures in the Bible, essentially telling us different things about the Bible, trying to clear up different misunderstandings. You know, for example, a lot of people believe that Jesus was sort of a homeless man, you know, and that he lived on the street and, you know, begged for food or something like that. But when you actually read the Bible, that picture of Jesus is not in the Bible. That was one of the things I remember. He spent a lot of time trying to clear up, showing that, no, Jesus wasn't poor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But he'd go through the Bible showing different things like that. But when I heard it, I mean, I liked it. I thought it was a great subject. I thought it was wonderful, but I didn't accept it. I didn't receive it because my mind was telling me, oh no, I don't know about this stuff. I was thinking, like a lot of Christians think today, I was thinking back then, you know, well, I don't know if God's interested. I think God's only interested in spiritual things. But Pastor Price would tell us, check it out for yourself. Hallelujah. So, I, you know, I didn't accept it, but I said, yeah, I'm going to check it out for myself. And I began to study it. Hallelujah. And I've been showing you some of those things. I'm trying to show you some of the things I learned from the Bible. And it turns out, hallelujah, it turns out that God's promises of prosperity, God's promise of prosperity for his people is everywhere in the Bible. It's not some tiny, by that I mean it's not some tiny little subject. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, and we will prosper you in some kind of, you know, little side thought that God, oh, and I think we'll throw in some prosperity. To, no, no. God's promise of prosperity is a central, a core, hallelujah, promise of the Bible. God's promise to prosper his people, to bring them success, to endue them with power for prosperity, success, and lots of children and long life, hallelujah. God's promise to prosper his people is it isn't just a side issue in the Bible. It's not, a, you know, like you go, you go to dinner and you order some side. It's not one of those sides you order at dinner, you know, it's the main meal. Hallelujah. It is everywhere in the Bible. It is one of the core promises of the Bible. And part of the reason that, or the reason, the main reason that Christians reject that idea, even though I'm, I'm clearly sure I'm going to, I have been, and am going to continue clearly showing you from the Bible that that's the case, that the God promising his people prosperity is a core, a core promise of the Bible. Hallelujah. Uh, you know, just like you would expect any good God to promise his people living on earth that he would take care of them. Hallelujah. That he would prosper them, that he would help them. Why wouldn't a good God want to prosper his people, and that's the real issue. Why wouldn't a good God want to prosper his people? Well, the reason uh, uh, Christians like myself balk, balk at this idea that, that prosperity, that God promising his people prosperity, that God promising his people that it would go well with them is one of the core promises of the Bible. The reason Christians balk at that, whoa, whoa, is because they have these theological ideas, they have these philosophical ideas about the spirituality of God, hallelujah, the spiritual, that God is not interested, he kind of looks down on the material world, hallelujah, that he's only interested, it's like I thought, he's only interested in material, th in spiritual things, he's not interested in material things, and so when you read this in the Bible, I mean, you it, it's, pretty clear in the Bible. It's not pretty clear. It's absolutely clear in the Bible that as a core promise that God is making to the people who follow him is that he will cause it to go well with them. He will cause them to prosper. He will cause them to have success. He will cause them to have abundance. He will cause them to have health. He will cause, I mean, does it strike? Just think about it in the abstract. Uh, wouldn't a God, any God, wouldn't that be what he was promising to his people? 
Hallelujah. Well, the Bible God is promising that to his people. And, and what surprised me when I began to study it is this, is what I just said, is that the promise of prosperity is ubiquitous. It is everywhere in the Bible. It is a core promise. It is a core idea of the Bible, of the God of the Bible. Hallelujah, hallelujah. It may not be a core idea. It may not be a core promise, a fundamental uh, of your God, but of the God of the Bible, it is a core idea. Yeah, your your God, your God may not be interested in those things, but the God of the Bible is very interested in those things. Your God may be too too spiritual for those things, but the God of the Bible, the God of Jesus Christ, the God of the Apostle Paul, the God, God of the Apostle Peter, that God, the Bible God, hallelujah, he is very interested in those things. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. That's what I'm trying to show you. Let's turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. And that's the subject. Uh, We've been looking at the scripture for quite a while. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm trying to show you what it says, you know, kind of the way I went through it. Let's read here in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. Um, Starting at verse 17, you may say to yourself, my power, the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. Hallelujah. Those are all the libertarians standing there in Deuteronomy, in the book of Deuteronomy, all the libertarians standing there. Ah, my power and the strengths of my hands have produced this wealth for me. Verse 18, but remember Yahweh your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. But remember Yahweh your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. I mean, this, is, this scripture is in the Bible. Hallelujah. This is Moses' interpretation. <laughs> this is Moses. Remember Moses. Guy walked up to the mountain, appeared to God face to face. God wrote, wrote some things on some stuff, handed him to him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is Moses. Hallelujah. But remember Yahweh your God, the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. And so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. And we saw that the ancestors was referring to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hallelujah. And this covenant that he's talking about here, it says in the NIV, it says, so confirms his covenant, or some translations, so fulfills his covenant, so keeps his covenant, so establishes his covenant. In other words, he's making the covenant come to pass in their lives. Hallelujah. In order to make the covenant, the promise, the treaty that he made with Abraham, in order to make the promise that he made to Abraham come to pass in their lives, he had to give them power. For it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. He had to give them ability or power to produce wealth in order to make the covenant, to fulfill the covenant to uh, establish the covenant, to make the covenant come to pass, to keep the promise is the way I like to put it. (laughs) In order to keep the promise that he swore to their ancestors, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he has to give them power to get wealth. Hallelujah. This 500 years later, 500 after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In order to keep the promise that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he has to give these people power to get wealth. In order to keep the promise, in order to fulfill the promise that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he swore to Abraham, not just a normal promise, he swore, I swear to you, Abraham, I will make you wealth. Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In order to keep the promise, the covenant that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob. Now he has to give their descendants power to get wealth. In order to fulfill the covenant, to keep the promise that he swore to their ancestors, Abraham, to their uh, fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hallelujah. 
He, in order to keep that, he has to give them power to get wealth today. That covenant he established, as it is today, he's establishing that covenant on that very day. In other words, he's fulfilling that covenant, making the covenant as though it's still in effect today. Hallelujah, as it is today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And we saw that uh, uh, the word the Bible uses for God's promising to prosper Abraham. Hallelujah, you can go back. I don't want to go over this all over again, but look at the last couple of episodes. But we saw that uh, when God uh, calls Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, how he promises, if you will go, well, let's turn over there and look at it real quick. Genesis chapter 12, this is the, the story. This is the story where God promises Abraham that he will make him wealthy. Hallelujah. This is the story right here in Genesis chapter 12. This is the promise. Hallelujah. That God must fulfill 500 years later. That in order to fulfill this promise that he swore to Abraham 500 years later. Hallelujah. He has to make those people wealthy. This is that story. A part of that story. I mean, it keeps going. Hallelujah. But I'm just kind of summarizing it here. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord had said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you, and verse four begins with, so Abraham went, hallelujah. So God tells Abraham, go to the land I will show you, hallelujah, and I will do something for you. Do what I tell you to do, and I will do something for you, hallelujah. Do what I tell you to do, and I will do something for you. Woohoo! hallelujah, and that's God's regular pattern in the Bible. Do what I tell I'll do something for you. And what is he going to do? I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. Hallelujah. And we saw that the word bless doesn't just mean, you know, it's not something you say when somebody says, bless you. That's not what God said. Every time you sneeze, I'll say, bless you, Abraham. Hallelujah. We saw several uh, 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 theological lexicons, several lexicons of the Hebrew language. And, and uh, I showed you that this word bless means to endure with power for success, prosperity, lots of children, and long life. God is, when God says, I will bless you, he's promising to give Abraham power, to put power upon him, to endure him with power for, pros for success, prosperity, lots of children, and long life. Woohoo! Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. So there's the promise that God, 500 years later, is talking about in Deuteronomy chapter 8. God is talking, I, in order to keep that promise I made to Abraham, that Moses is talking about in Deuteronomy chapter 8, he said, in order for God to keep the promise he made to Abraham, he has to make you wealthy. Hallelujah. He's the one. He's given you power to get wealth in order to keep that promise he made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Hallelujah. 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 Now, next part I need you to see is this. The promise. Okay, so God promised to bless Abraham. God promised to endue him with power for prosperity, success, lots of children, and long life. Uh, you can see in both places, you can see in Deuteronomy 8.18, that that was part of the promise, prosperity. Hallelujah. In order to keep the promise, he had to make them prosper. So therefore, the promise had to include prosperity, right? And then we see in Deuteronomy 8, you say, and I showed you from the Bible that the word bless means to prosper, just like the lexicon say, to endure with power for prosperity, success, lots of children, and long life. Hallelujah. Now, the next part I need you to see is this. Abraham's descendants inherited God's promise of prosperity. Abraham's, it wasn't just to Abraham. Uh, you can say, you know, 500 years later in Deuteronomy 8.18, you could just skip there, right? He said, well, obviously, they inherited his promise of prosperity, but I'm going to show it to you a little more slowly. God, uh, here's what I need you to say. Abraham's descendants inherited God's promise of prosperity. Abraham's descendants 
inherited God's promise of prosperity. Abraham's descendants inherited God's promise of prosperity. Abraham's descendants inherited God's promise of prosperity. In other words, it was passed down from generation to generation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So look look here in Hallelujah. 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 Okay. Hallelujah. (laughs) Let's turn over to Genesis chapter 26. I was going to skip over this, but let me go ahead and show it to you. Hallelujah. 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 This is the story of Abraham's son, Isaac. Hallelujah. I want you to see that Isaac inherited God's promise, the the promise of prosperity that God had made to Abraham when he said he would bless him. Hallelujah. I want you to see that Isaac inherited that promise. Look here in Genesis chapter 26, verse 1. Isaac inherits the promise of prosperity. Verse 1. Now there was famine in the land besides the previous famine in Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. Verse 2. Yahweh appeared to Isaac, the Lord, Yahweh, appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Hallelujah. What did God say to Abraham? Go to the land that I will show you and I will bless you. Now God is telling Isaac there's a famine in the land. What is famine in the land? We would call it a recession, or maybe it was a really big famine. We would call it a depression, you know, an economic depression. There's nothing. There's no jobs. There's no food. Hallelujah. And this time, no doubt, there'd been some kind of drought in the land. There was a lack of rain in the land. When there was a lack of rain in that land, there wouldn't be any crops. Hallelujah. There there wouldn't be grass for the the sheep and the goats and whatever else they had to eat. Hallelujah. So if there's no crops, if there's no food for the sheep and the goats and the other cattle, hallelujah. If there's no water for the trees, for the fruit trees and the nut trees and the olive trees and all that, hallelujah. What happens? There's no food. There's a famine in the land. Hallelujah. What I want you to see is that it was kind of a dire circumstance. You know, it wasn't a good place to be. It was a place you wanted to get out of. Hallelujah. It was a place you wanted to go from. Hallelujah. 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 Now there was famine in the land besides the previous famine in Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar, Yahweh appeared to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt. Why would they be thinking of going? Well, in Egypt, Egypt isn't irrigated by rain. Egypt is irrigated by canals using the Nile River, hallelujah, as their source. So you could have famine right next door where Abraham is, but in Egypt, everything would be going fine. So you know there's famine in the land, hallelujah, where you're at. You know your animals don't have anything to eat. You know the trees aren't bearing any fruit. You know, the olive trees aren't making olives. You know, the grass isn't even growing. Hallelujah. So now there's no food for your kids. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But you know that over in Egypt, this thing that caused the famine is not even a problem over there. Hallelujah. They irrigate. They (laughs) irrigate from the Nile River. They don't have to rely on the rain. So let's go to Egypt is your thought. Hallelujah. Now there was famine in the land besides the previous famine in Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, and Gerar. The Lord, Yahweh, appeared to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt. That's what I'm explaining about Egypt, why God told him not to go down. In other words, his temptation was to go down to Egypt. Do not go down to Egypt, live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you and will bless you. Woohoo! Hallelujah, hallelujah. What is God promising to do? Stay in this land for a while. I will be with you and what? I will bless you. What does bless mean? To endure with power for prosperity, success, for success, prosperity, lots of children and long life. Hallelujah. God is promising again, stay in this land for a while and I will be with you and will 
bless you for to you and your descendants I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed. Verse 5, because Abraham obeyed me. When did God, Abraham obey him? Well, different times, but the one we were looking at, Genesis chapter 12, go to the land that, did Abraham go? It says he went, hallelujah. hallelujah. And there were other times that Abraham obeyed God. I want you to see the connection between obeying God and receiving the blessings, hallelujah. Because Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commandments, my decrees, and my instructions. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We hear that language all over. Hallelujah, uh, the, the book of Deuteronomy. Keeping my commands, my decrees, and my instructions. Hallelujah. So what did Abraham do? He kept God's the commands, his decrees, and his instructions. Hallelujah. And as a result of that, hallelujah, God has this covenant with him. Hallelujah. Because Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commands, my decrees, my instructions. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. Hallelujah. Now go back to verse 3. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands, will confirm the earth I swore to your father Abraham. Now think about what he's telling him. Stay in this land. That's why I went into the big explanation about what a famine is. There was famine in the land. That means there's no food for your babies. That means there's no food for your uh, animals. That means there's no food for your uh, servants. That means there's no food for your family. Hallelujah. Can you see that? So you've got all these people and, and, and the, 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 what is it? The rational, the logical decision is to do what? We better get over to Egypt. They still got food over here. We got famine over there. I just came from Egypt, sir. And yeah, they got plenty of food. No, stay here. I want you to understand the decision, the trust that Isaac is reposing in God. Hallelujah. Isaac is trusting God. Isaac is walking by faith. Isaac, by obeying God, is walking by faith. Isaac, by obeying God, is believing. Does that make sense to you? Isaac, Abraham, by obeying God, is believing. What is believing? What is faith? According to the book of Greg, faith is three things. It's knowing something on the inside, or you could put it this way, hearing from God in your spirit. Hallelujah. And what's the second? Acting on what you know on the inside. And then number three, enduring. Hallelujah. In what you're doing. Can you see that? So Isaac here, he heard from God. What did God tell him? Stay in the land. Woo! That's where you want to get. You want to be, get to the place where down in here, down here in your spirit, God's telling you what to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then when you act on that, hallelujah, God will bless you. Hallelujah. That's where you want to get. You want to know what God is saying to do down in here, and then you have to act on it. So that's what happened here. Stay in the land for a while. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father, Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. will give them all these lands. Through your offspring, all nations on the earth will be blessed because I'm going to do this because Abraham obeyed me, did everything I required of him, keeping my commands, my decrees, my instructions. And then it says, so Isaac stayed in Gerar. He didn't go to Egypt. He didn't leave the land. He did what God said to do. Hallelujah. What do I, what do I want you to see? Abraham's descendants inherited, God, inherited God's promise to bless them. Hallelujah. Abraham's descendants inherited God's promise to prosper them. Now skip down a little bit. It talks about uh, his sister, his wife, and all this. But skip down to verse uh, 12. Hallelujah. Verse 12. So he stayed in the land. It tells us, right? He stayed. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. Now skip down to verse 12. 
Isaac planted crops in that land in the midst of famine. Isaac planted crops in that land, the land that was experiencing famine. What does famine mean? There's no food. Why is there no food? The trucks didn't arrive. You know, the shipments didn't come in from Chile and, 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 and from the United States and, and from, you know, wherever they grow food. I don't know. Hallelujah. From Argentina. The beef didn't come from Argentina or from Brazil. Hallelujah. The produce didn't come from Chile and from Peru. It didn't land on the ships. The trucks didn't arrive. Is that why they're having famine in the land? No, they're having famine in the land because there's no rain. When there's no rain, there's no food for them in that land. Hallelujah. But look what Isaac does. He stays in the land and look what he does. I want you to see this famine, hallelujah, was a, a result of no rain. Hallelujah. Can you see it? Isaac planted crops in that land. So in the midst of this famine land, Isaac planted crops. Instead of going to Egypt, which made sense, which was the logical, rational thing to do. Isaac stayed in the land. Isaac planted crops in that land. And the same year reaped a hundredfold because Yahweh blessed him. The Lord blessed him. Isaac planted crops in that land. And the same year reaped a hundredfold because Yahweh blessed him. Sometimes we hear a hundredfold and we think a hundred percent. No, a hundred percent just means doubling, right? No, this is a hundred. This isn't doubling. This isn't tripling. This isn't quadrupling. This isn't quintupling. This isn't septupling or whatever comes next. This is hundred dupling. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isaac planted crops in the land and the same year reaped a hundredfold. No, woo! It was like a bumper crop. He reaped the most. Woo! What happens when you have a bumper crop and there's famine in the land? What happens when you have a bumper crop and there's famine in the land? What happens when you have a bumper crop and there's famine in the land? That's when you make the big money. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I know we had a, a relative, a cousin of my mom's, hallelujah, lived up, up north of us a little ways and uh, he was in the tomato business. Hallelujah. And there was something wrong, something happened to the tomatoes that year. And, uh, you know, there's a big, huge demand for tomatoes in the United States. Apparently, the tomatoes mostly go for the making of ketchup. And so my, uh, I think he was, he was my mom's cousin or uncle, uncle, uncle Thurlow, I think is, hallelujah. And uh, he was a farmer, he farmed tomatoes. And he was the, what I want you to see, there was something happened to all the tomatoes, hallelujah, but, he, but his tomatoes came out okay, hallelujah. And so he, when it came time, he, would, he was like the only guy that had tomatoes for sale. Guess what happened to him? Woo! He hit the lottery. He won the lottery, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Well, that's what's happened to Isaac here. Isaac planted crops in that land. What land? The land of famine. And the same year reaped a hundredfold, woo, bumper crop. He has crops, nobody else has crops. What's gonna happen to Isaac? He's gonna become wealthy. Why did he become? Because he obeyed the Lord and the Lord blessed him. Isaac planted crops in that land and the same year reaped a hundredfold. Why did he reap a hundredfold? Because the Lord blessed him. What does bless mean? To endure with power for prosperity, success, lots of children and long life. Hallelujah. The man became rich and his wealth, can, he didn't just stop at rich. God didn't just stop him at rich. Oh, well, that's plenty. Plenty. We don't want to get greedy. We don't want to get greedy. I said, you're getting greedy now. You know, hallelujah. You can get greedy. The Bible's against greedy. The Bible's against chasing after money. Hallelujah. But when you chase after God, he gives you more. He gives you an abundance. He gives you plenty. He gives you wealth and riches. Hallelujah. Come measure it with his Godness. Hallelujah. Does that make sense to you? God blesses you commensurate with his greatness as a God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And in this case, the man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. Hallelujah. 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 So you can see there that the promise was passed down to his descendants. Watch, turn over to, well, let's look at Psalm 105. 
Psalm 105, what I want you to see, that the promise God made to Abraham, that Abraham's descendants inherited that promise. Abraham's descendants inherited God's promise to prosper him. You can see it there in Isaac, hallelujah. Why did God show up for Isaac, hallelujah? Because of Abraham, hallelujah. Now that blessing, I will bless, stay in this land, and I, now, now it's Isaac, Isaac's turn, hallelujah. Can you see that? He inherited the blessing from his father. Now look here, Psalm 105, verse one, give praise to Yahweh, the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Look to Yahweh and his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles, the judgments he pronounced, you, his servants, the descendants of Abraham, his chosen ones, the children of Jacob. He is Yahweh, our God, the Lord, our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. Hallelujah. That's the part I want you to see. He remembers his covenant forever. What covenant? The covenant that he made with Abraham, that he renewed again with Isaac, that he renewed again with Jacob, that he renewed again with the children of Israel through Moses and the giving of the law. Hallelujah. 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 He remembers his covenant forever. The promise he made for a thousand generations. How much is a thousand generations? Well, let's say a generation is 20 years. Then what would a thousand of those generations be, it'd be 20,000 years. So it's a law. This covenant continues, hallelujah, for 20,000 years. This covenant continues for a long, long time, hallelujah. So he says he remembers his covenant forever, hallelujah. The reason I'm making that a point is because some people, oh no, that covenant passed away. That covenant, no, it's a covenant forever, the promise he made is a covenant for a thousand generations, for 20,000 years. Hallelujah, if you want. Uh, the co which covenant? Verse 9, the covenant he made with Abraham. Hallelujah. The oath he swore to Isaac. Verse 10, he confirmed it to Jacob as a decree, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you I will give the land of Cain. Canaan, as the portion you will inherit. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. All I want you to see, if you keep reading, you can read. He goes through different, you know, uh, incidents that happened to the children of Israel and, and sort of a brief summary of the history of the children of Israel. But all I want you to see is that part. Uh, he remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree, to Israel as an everlasting, to you I will give the land as the portion you will inherit. So this covenant wasn't just made with Abraham, but it was inherited by Isaac, and then it was inherited by Jacob, and then it was inherited by the children of Israel. Turn over to uh, Exodus, the book of Exodus. This is when the children of Israel had gone into Egypt. Hallelujah. And at first they went in and they were just, you know, living there. And then uh, over time, they sort of began to abuse these foreigners, as is what people do to foreigners. Oh, I got to get those foreigners. Hallelujah. So the children of Israel began to be abused and were turned into slaves. Verse 23, during that long period, this is a period of several hundred years, during that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. Verse 24, God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Hallelujah. God heard their groan. They were slaves. They were enslaved by these people. God heard them crying. God heard their groaning. He remembered his covenant. Which covenant? The covenant he made with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. What's that have to do with these people? Hallelujah. That covenant belongs to them. They're the inheritors of that covenant that God made with Abraham. It's a covenant. How long does it last? It's, it's a perpetual covenant. It lasts for 
uh, 20,000 year covenant. Hallelujah. Well, what happens after Abraham dies? Where does that covenant go? God said it's a, per, you know, it's it's a everlasting covenant. Hallelujah. It's last for, you know, uh, a thousand generations for 20,000 years. Well, Abraham didn't last for 20,000 years. Isaac didn't last for 20, Jacob didn't last. Where did the covenant go? It was inherited by his children. So now we see several hundred years later, several hundred years, 500 years or something. So after the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, here are the children of Israel. They're crying, God, help us. God, help us. God, help us. They might even not, they probably don't even know God that well. God, help us. God, help us. And it says here, God heard their groaning. He remembered his covenant. Remember doesn't mean, in Hebrew, remember doesn't just mean I brought something. Oh, Wow, yeah, oh, Abraham, oh yeah, remember Abraham? Yeah, whatever happened to that guy? No, that's not, remembering in Hebrew also has this idea of, of acting on something, hallelujah, of, of doing something. So that's really what it says. God heard their groaning and he acted on his covenant with Abraham. He put his covenant with Abraham into effect. He, he worked his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So you can tell that's what I mean. So God looked on the Israelites, was concerned about them, and he began planning their deliverance, their rescue, their salvation. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. All I want you to see, though, is this covenant belonged to, I don't even think, honestly, I don't think these people barely know God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You know, like the pilgrims came over to the United States, you know, and they were really, you know, focused on the things of God. And I read in the history once, like two generations later, the people weren't even going to church. Three generations later, the people weren't even, oh yeah, we can't go to church. We got to earn money. We got to work here. But their fathers had been so committed to God. Well, you know, here's similar thing. It's been several hundred years. I don't think these people had much of a relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And yet, because they are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, what happens? That covenant is still working. Hallelujah, halle, it's an everlasting covenant. It lasts for 20,000, this has only been a few generations. <laughs> it hadn't been 20,000 years, it's been several, 500 years, hallelujah. So it's got, you know, 19,500 years left to go, is the way you could think about it, hallelujah. But all I want you to see for right now, is that the descendants of Abraham inherit the promise of prosperity. Hallelujah. That's what we're focusing on. I mean, they inherited more than that, but we're just focusing on the prosperity part. The inheritance of Abraham, hallelujah. Uh, the, I'm sorry, the, the descendants of Abraham inherited the promise of prosperity. Watch, turn back to, where were we? Uh, turn back to Psalm 105, and so it's given this recounting, right? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Talking about the covenant he made, verse nine. We just read this, right? He, verse eight, he remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you I will give the land of Canaan as a portion you will inherit. When they were but few in number, few indeed strangers, they wandered from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another. He allowed no one to oppress them for their sake. He rebuked kings, do not touch my anointed ones, do my prophets no harm. He called down famine on the land, destroyed all their supplies. He sent them man before them, Joseph. So he stood the story of Joseph, sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with shackles, his neck was put in iron till what he foretold came to pass, till the word of Yahweh proved him true. The king sent and released him. The rulers of the people set him free. He made him master of his household, ruler over all he possessed to instruct his princes as he pleased and teach his elders wisdom. Hallelujah. Can you see God raised up uh, Joseph, why? Because of this covenant that he had with Abraham. Hallelujah. He didn't leave him in the prison. He raised him up Woo! because he listened to God. Verse 23, then Israel entered Egypt. Jacob resided as a foreigner in the land of Ham. Yahweh made his people very fruitful. He made them too numerous for their foes whose hearts he turned to hate his people, to conspire against his servant. He sent Moses, his servant, and Aaron, whom he had chosen. They performed his signs among them, his wonders in the land of Ham. He sent darkness, made the land dark. For had 
they not rebelled against his words, he turned their waters into blood, causing their fish to die. Their land teemed with first time about the, you know, the 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 plagues on the Egypt that Moses gave for signs. So let my people go, or you'll receive these plagues. Hallelujah. Their land teemed with frogs. They've been enslaved. These people have been enslaved. Hallelujah. God is going to free them. Let my people go. Hallelujah. Moses said, let my people go. He turned their water. So now he's doing these. Uh, <laughs> hallelujah. 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 These plagues are coming on, on Egypt and to, to, to encourage Pharaoh to let the people go. He turned their waters into blood, causing their fish to die, their land teem with fraud, which went up into the bedrooms of their rulers. He spoke, and there came swarms of flies and gnats throughout their country. He turned their rain into hail with lightning throughout their land. Egypt is the most powerful kingdom in the world at this time, one of the most powerful kingdoms, if not the most powerful kingdom in the world. The, he went to the president, Moses went to the president of Egypt and said, let my people go. The president of Egypt said, no way, Jose, they belong to me. I own them. I depend on them for my money. They represent money to me. No, I will not let them go. So how God responds by punishing him. And he keeps doing these things. Okay, well, these things came. Let my people go. No! He, he turned their rain into hail with lightning throughout their land. He struck down their vines and fig trees, shattered the trees of their country. He spoke and the locusts came, grasshoppers without number. They ate up everything in their land, ate up the produce of their soil. And still they would not let the people go. Then he struck down all the firstborn in their land, the first fruits of all their manhood. Verse 37 this is the part I want to get to. He brought out Israel. They were slaves. He brought out Israel, laid him with silver and gold. And from among their tribes, no one faltered. Hallelujah. He brought out Israel, laid him with silver and gold. And from among their tribes, no one faltered. Hallelujah. Why is that in the Bible? Because he brought them out rich. Hallelujah. He brought them out rich. He, you know, they'd been, the Egyptians had been stealing their labor for three or four hundred years, whatever it was. Now, nah, it's payday. It's payday, dudes. Hallelujah. 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 Does that make sense to you? Watch, turn back to Exodus for a second. This was part, we had just finished reading this part, but hallelujah. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me do it this way. Turn. So we just, we just finished reading this in, in Exodus chapter 2. It says, God heard their groaning and he remembered. In other words, he acted on his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. I just want to show you the next chapter. This is, that was chapter 2. This is chapter 3. Now scroll down to the end of chapter 3. Now I want you to see this is all part of God's plan. Hallelujah. Verse 21, and I will make, so he's telling them he's going to deliver them, and I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards his people so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters, and so you will plunder the Egyptians. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They had plundered these people. They had plundered the children of Israel for three or four hundred years. Now it's time for them to plunder the Egyptians. But all I want you to see is this was part of God's plan. That prosperity is so central to his covenant. Hallelujah. With Abraham, he, God didn't just say, yeah, and you get out. Woo! Yeah, let's thank God. That's good enough. Hallelujah but he provides for them. I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people so that when you leave, you will not go empty handed. Hallelujah. They went out with silver and gold. Hallelujah. 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 Listen, if you only remember one thing, remember this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
God's promise of prosperity is central. Hallelujah. It's a core promise of the Bible. Hallelujah. Unfortunately, I'm out of time, but I'm not finished. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, if you enjoyed this message, please share it with your friends. Help us spread the message. Help us spread the good news that God is interested in our financial material well-being. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That God promises us financial material well-being. So share it with friends, relatives, neighbors. Hallelujah. Also, if you liked it, it'll help us reach more people on YouTube. If you'll hit the like button, if you'll subscribe, hit the notification bell and leave us a good comment. Hallelujah. If you want to learn more, you can go to our website, www.ibchristiancenter.com. If you want to contribute to keep this ministry going, you can do so at our website by hitting on the Feed the Ox button, and you'll be able to give a donation through PayPal. And thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you who have been been uh, donating and helping support this ministry and helping keep this ministry going. We really, 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 really appreciate it. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.